Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. The new warehouse is back, and I'm excited to share the new website with you, thenewwarehouse.com. That's the new, new, new warehouse. So go check out thenewwarehouse.com. Give me your feedback. Let me know what you think. Send me an email, kevin at thenewwarehouse.com. That's kevin at thenewwarehouse.com. Or just find me on LinkedIn, Kevin Lawton. Send me a message, whatever is the easiest way for you. Really, really excited to bring you guys the newwarehouse.com redone. So really interested to hear your feedback and what you think. So please let me know. On today's episode, I was joined by the Chief Operating Officer at White Box, Rob Hahn. So let's hear his safety tip. My safety tip is that you are the owner of the safety of those uh, around you and yourself. It's always a good reminder that throughout your day, um, looking for opportunities to find safety around you and, and talk about it with those around you is actually one of the greatest safety improvements that we can make as a team. Great safety tip from Rob, and definitely always about the team, not only making yourself safe, but making sure that your team is safe as well, and you're always looking out for each other. So great safety tip, and if you would like to share your safety tip, head to speakpipe.com slash the new warehouse. That's speakpipe.com slash the new warehouse. Would love to hear your safety tip. So let's hear a word from our sponsor before we get into today's episode. Fulfillment demand continues to skyrocket and outpace available labor. To keep up, warehouse operators are turning to flexible fulfillment solutions like Six River Systems. Utilizing Six River Systems' award-winning combination of collaborative robots, artificial intelligence, and operational expertise will make your associates and wall-to-wall fulfillment workflow more efficient. No new infrastructure, no change to warehouse layout, easy to deploy and scale, easy to train and retain associates, all at half the cost of traditional automation. Want to take your fulfillment operation to the next level? Level? Go to www.sixriver.com to learn more. That's www.sixriver.com to learn more. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawton with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. On today's episode, I am going to be joined by Rob Hahn. He is the Chief Operating Officer at White Box. And White Box does many things. Um, basically, they help you. Uh, they're somewhat of a 3PL, I believe, and they help you um, from filling your orders uh, to marketing your products as well. Um, a lot of different things. And obviously, this is a new warehouse, so we're going we're gonna to focus a little bit in on the fulfillment side. And we're also going to talk to Rob about some of his experience as well. He, he is a former Amazon uh, exec and warehouse manager, general manager as well. Um, I think his, pretty much his career has been in Amazon. So, so we're going to talk to him about his career, uh, find out how he got over to transition to White Box and how his Amazon experience has helped him with that and also uh, learn about White Box and what it is they're doing now as well. So, Rob, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to uh, have you on. Happy to uh, hear about your journey here. So uh, why don't you tell us, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit about, you know, I spent some time in Amazon. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience and kind of how you ended up uh, where you are now at, at White Box? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think my, my story kind of started, uh, you know, my parents were both uh, entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. actually, and I always really... Uh, lean toward the idea of, of entrepreneurship. And actually, it was my major in college. I went to a small 
private school on, outside Fort Wayne, Indiana for college. And I actually majored in entrepreneurship there. I, I always really wanted to be part of a small business and, and to build something. And uh, as I was looking for internships between my junior and senior year of, of college, I, uh, one of my friends who knew a guy uh, who was actually at Amazon, at, uh, kind of a mid-level HR person, mm. I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, are you guys doing any internships? And uh, it was, Amazon at that time didn't do undergrad internship uh, program. Um, but I actually, uh, I was in the first year that they did that program. So I was able to apply and uh, was chosen for the position. And, and I took the opportunity to say, hey, you know, it started as, you know, I'll jump in, I'll, you know, the big company thing, I'll learn some stuff, and then I'll be able to go do my own thing. But I actually really enjoyed the opportunity to, to step in uh, into that operation at the time. I mean, you got to remember Amazon at the time was Amazon.com, right? Like uh, there were some people that didn't know where I worked um, a decade ago, which sounds crazy when you think that about it today. Sounds insane. Yeah. It's, it sounds absolutely crazy. Um, but uh, you know, at, at the time, something eight to 10 fulfillment centers across the U.S., um, really no robotics, uh, you know, mm. just starting really into automation. The building I stepped into at the time was extremely manual versus, you know, what you compare it to today. So it was a really different world I, I stepped into at that time. And, and uh, one of the things that really drew me to Amazon at the time and, and operations was uh, I just had this incredible opportunity to affect things from day one. Mm. So, you know, walking into this environment at Amazon even then was – it felt larger than life. Uh, and I just really was super excited and felt very fortunate to kind of walk into this environment and uh, be able to affect things on day one. Uh, it feels from the outside that Amazon would have everything together from an operational standpoint. And, and they really didn't and, and they don't uh, in many ways today. I mean, a lot, very much different uh, world today than it was back then, but yeah. they really leaned on operators to be innovators. Um, and so I just really love that environment. And so I made the most of my, you know, 12 week internship program was extended an offer for a full time uh, area manager position uh, starting in, you know, uh, in quality control. And so I stepped into 22 years old and uh, leading 250 people, uh, wow. which is kind of <laughs> kind of kind of wild uh, wow. at the end of the day. Um, but just very fortunate I was able to step in and start doing, you know, le real leadership transactions at a very young age. Um, and I, and I got hooked, uh, on the ownership, the expectations, the pace of that environment and the reality that we could go change and, and just do so many things at, uh, at the same time. It's just a really unique environment. And, uh, I, from there, I, I just really got to, um, took a leap into going headfirst into all that Amazon could offer. And, uh, so I moved up very, very quickly. I, you know, became, quickly became a leader, uh, an operations manager, uh, leading a team, uh, my team is about 600, pe 600 people uh, under a few managers underneath me. And then uh, I got a really kind of pivotal opportunity in 2015. I'd been in Indianapolis and in one of the fulfillment centers there. And uh, they looked for some of the, uh, the better operators to open up one of the first robotics fulfillment centers mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I had a really incredibly cool opportunity to, to go step into it at that time and, and really you know, uh, Kiva Robotics was acquired and they launched, you know, the first building and started testing. And I got to go into really one of the first production buildings. And that was just uh, an incredible opportunity to not really be a cog in the wheel, but instead really get my hands dirty with, uh, you know, something nobody else in the world had really done. And, and that's kind of figure out how to, to, to help the human beings and the robotics really work together um, and help design some of that software and, how, you know, how, and, and how the hardware was already designed to, to kind of optimize how, uh, how Amazon was doing those processes, specifically focused on the inbound processes where I spent most of my career for the first five or six years at Amazon. Um, so I was a sub subject, subject matter expert, uh, and I was able to you know, get pulled in and, and jump into robotics. It was a kind of life-altering experience, just the, the scope, the scale, um, the resources put on that, and you know, a real stage to go solve some really fun and interesting problems. So. That's when I became, I was actually the youngest senior manager ever at Amazon at that time. Wow. Uh, a team of, uh, you know, 1,800 people and, uh, you know, stepping into the first robotics, one of the first robotics buildings at Amazon and, and really getting a cool opportunity to kind of spearhead that, mm -hmm. that initiative for Amazon. Now they have, you know, uh, 50 plus of those warehouse types, but we were very early on uh, and very positive experience. So 
spent two years as a senior manager. And then that's when I was able to kind of graduate and, and get my own building. And that's when I became the youngest exe- and at that time. I don't know. I'm not actually tracking uh, if, that, if that's still true or not. But at the time I was the youngest uh, person to kind of take off, take on an executive level role, level role uh, leading a building as a general manager in, in Baltimore. So I moved from Kenosha, Wisconsin to, to Baltimore to lead million square foot, um, large Amazon robotics fulfillment center, uh, in downtown Baltimore, it's just uh, a really incredibly cool experience. Um, you know, thousands of people, and it's like you're mayor of a town. Yeah. Right at the end of the day, yeah. there's just so so much stuff going on. Huge budget, lots of uh, lots of scale at the time. I mean, you gotta think about the you know the East Coast of the United States mm. is such a high density shipping area. At the time, Amazon actually had very poor coverage over it. Um, so we were essentially running at max capacity for the vast majority of the year, not just during those peak times. So a, a lot higher utilization rate throughout the entire year. So really cool learning experience mm-hmm. um, uh, there. Uh, I think for me and, and kind of when I made the transition, so that was 2017, I came over to, to Baltimore. Um, I found myself spending, uh, again, overall, like I had an enormously positive experience at Amazon. I'm very grateful yeah. for my time there. But I did find as I moved more up in, in leadership roles at Amazon, kind of my job was to focus on how do we get decision points out of our processes, I found that I was doing less innovation and more optimization. I think that there's really two okay. kinds of people and builders and optimizers, and they're, they're not one better than the other, just really important and critical in every single uh, organization that they both exist. Mm-hmm. And I've just, I'm more of a builder. I, I just, I get a lot more excitement out of that, it's something I think I'm good at. And so I found myself doing less of that building and innovation and more optimization. And Uh, So I chose to kind of have a path and one was go, you know, stay at Amazon and try something, uh, find something different at Amazon that I could go help build again or transition into, uh, you know, outside of Amazon and try something different. So I ran into the founders of of White Box. I came in very early on. They were, uh, we were just raising our seed round at the time. Um, But the concept was very interesting to me. So I, I, made that transition and uh, made the kind of terrifying leap, if you will, uh, <laughs> yeah. from, from the, uh, the comfort of the Amazon world yeah. uh, in, into, you know, a startup um, with a lot of potential. So uh, that's, that's kind of been my path. And, and, you know, that was about two and a half years ago, mid, mid 2018. I think I actually started on prime day, ironically enough oh, wow. of <laughs> 2018 <laughs> over at white box as the chief operating officer. So it's, and it's been a fun ride since. Wow. wow. Yeah. It's, that's a pretty amazing journey. And, uh, you know, like you said, it's it's a lot of rapid growth um, in a short period of time for a young professional. And then you you know you said it in there. You're you're the youngest to hit some of these milestones within Amazon. And you know, I mean, imagining when you started, I think you said what there was eight to ten distribution centers yeah. in the country. I mean, yeah. that's it's like I mean, crazy to think about. Yeah, yeah, and there's probably 150 plus now, um, yeah. right? Of you know, similar type of setup. So it definitely was you know, a really interesting eight years to kind of see that hyper growth and, and be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, right where I am in New Jersey, I think there's like, uh, there's probably five within like <laughs> yeah. 25 miles from me. Yep. So, yeah. so it's interesting, but, um, you know, we have, we have some, uh, younger professionals that, that listen to the show as well. Some college students and students, uh, recently graduated as well. Um, you know, coming out of school at, at 22, um, after this internship program and, and leading up, you know, 250 people. I mean, that's, that can be a lot. Um, and that can say yeah. a lot to recent graduates. So I'm curious, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have for some of these younger professionals who may be looking to get into a similar type of career or more, maybe finding themselves falling into that type of career, similar to kind of what you did? Yeah, I think the, uh, I think the advice I got around that same time for me was, was really helpful. And that was, uh, don't shy away from just finding the hardest thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that's, that's what I tried to look for. I, I two, two main things for me. It was one, say yes a lot. Okay. Uh, say yes to new opportunities. Um, they're going to be scary sometimes. They're going to be challenging. Um, but finding the, the hardest job out there is going to really get the skill set that you're, that you're looking for. I think the other thing, is maybe a little ironic coming for me because I moved up so quickly. I, I frequently have given this to Amazon leaders when they would ask me similar question. And mm. it's really be, be patient. Like the skill set you're learning uh, is really about growth. Focus on growth, not on promotion. Okay. Uh, if you focus on growth, focus on the skills that are going to lead to uh, make you more valuable. If you have a lot of impact 
and you you are growing as an individual personally and professionally mm-hmm. is going to lead to more opportunities and if you're saying yes to those opportunities um good stuff comes from that i mean uh, i i got similar advice to that uh and that's kind of been my guiding principle as i've continued to grow in my career over the last decade Interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely good advice. And, um, you know, we, we actually have, we have similar backgrounds. I didn't spend time at Amazon, but, um, you know, I also went to school for, for entrepreneurial studies and kind of started out in, uh, inventory control and quality as well. So, so it's pretty Thanks. interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. and yeah, I got to ask you from, uh, from a personal perspective, actually, you know, um, I, I mean, I never led a team of 250 people or 1800 <laughs> people. Um, but, you know, when I, I was on the younger side as well, when I was supervising my first team in quality and many had been with the company for a long time um, and a lot of them were quite older than me. So I'm curious, you know, how did how did you deal with um, some employees that might have been older, um, which I imagine the majority were since you were only right. 22 yeah. Um, how, how do you, how do you it's kind of, hard, it's hard not to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 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 I mean, how, how did you kind of deal with the, I guess, uh, the kind of, it's kind of inevitable where you have the, some employees that are older and you know, what is it? Well, what does this kid know? You know, you know, how, how do you deal with that? And what, what kind of advice do you have to, for young leaders on that side? Yeah, I think this was the this is the thing, right? As a young leader, yeah. specifically in operations, where you know you're dealing with such a uh, variety of, of backgrounds that people come from. I mean, I don't think a ton of people, even me growing up, thought, "Man, I just really want to work in a warehouse." Right? Like, right. It's, you yeah. know, I I'm very ple- I'm so incredibly fortunate that that is where I've landed in my life. Um, but that's not what you expect, and I think that's true for a lot of uh, a lot of people that end up, you know, finding that as a career path and. So I think as, as a young person, it's, uh, it's really hard. Like you take on a leadership role where, um, you know, I, I kind of talk about this, uh, like you're, you're the person they go to and talk about at their dinner table, right? Yeah. Like you're, <laughs> you're the good day and you're the bad day. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on that. I, I always felt enormous pressure, um, around that being the truth. But I think the the thing for me, which, which kind of was a breakthrough moment is that, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that are differences for, for people. And I think uh, my focus on the similarities, I think, helped. Uh, first of all, everybody wants everybody wants you to be direct, be truthful, and being honest. Um, like, that is true of every single person. Everybody wants uh, to be led. Uh, I think the reality is very few people, um, really, you get to grasp this. And, and, like, giving tough feedback is really difficult, but people do want that people want to know that you care enough to take the opportunity to give them tough honest direct um, partnership type of feedback and Mm. and i think the at at our core we're all kind of the same um, which maybe doesn't feel very disney special or anything like that but uh, (laughs) we we want a purpose um, which sometimes packing boxes and counting things is not uh, doesn't doesn't correlate the best but like you are the value that uh, as a leader, you're the value that someone gets at the end of the day, right? Um, they're going to go home and not talk about the box they packed. They're going to talk about the interaction you had or the, the thank you or the tough conversation that you had with them. Yeah. And I think that that's both exciting and scary uh, yeah. for, you know, a, a young leader. And, you know, it's the thing that kept me up at night um, quite a bit. But I, I think as I got some of those just, you know, shooting free throws, just doing it over and over and over um, with having some of those interactions. I think the best, the best thing that I took from that was be direct, be honest, pay attention, um, and look for opportunities to give both positive and negative feedback as frequently as you can. That's really good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you too, as well, you know, as, um, even being in a, a similar situation that I, that I referenced, you know, where the majority of the team that I was supervising was quite older and had been with the company for, uh, I think the shortest amount of tenure somebody had for the company and that team was like 18 years. So it was a lot of like <laughs> better. Yeah. That's not easy. <laughs> yeah. And I had been with That's the company, I think like two years. So they're kind of like, right. you know, you know, what do you know? And this and stuff. So, so, and I, I found the same thing, you know, it's just being, you know, honest with them and, and direct is, is the way to go. Um, and then, you know, also being, you know, kind of, kind of open to, hearing what they have to say too, because maybe, you know, they do know what they're talking about sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. I, that, that's a, that's a really good point. One of the things yeah. that 
uh, I liked about the environment that Amazon provided was that we don't like, we didn't really didn't care about where good ideas came from. Right. We just care about good ideas. So it kind of actually helped that I was like, I, I actually don't care if I'm the person that comes up with that idea. If you mean that genuinely yeah. uh, and you, and you ask for feedback, they give you feedback and you act upon that feedback. That is such a dramatically impactful thing for any human being in any environment. Um, and that's no different than, you know, when you're trying to do it in a warehouse environment, it's, it's just uh, nothing more powerful than, than like truly being a partner as a leader in that way. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you kind of giving us some, uh, some insight there because you've been through a lot of different experiences in a, in a rapid time, um, especially for a younger professional as well. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the goals of, of the whole podcast is to, is to get uh, younger professionals interested in, in the warehousing industry as well. Cause you know, much like yourself, uh, when I was younger as well, I didn't, I didn't say, Oh, I'm going to go work, work in a warehouse when I'm older. Um, but I've found there's like a ton of, ton of great experiences and learning experiences and, you know, I've been able to, like you mentioned, it's such a, such a diverse background of people in the industry that you've been able to be exposed to so many different things. It's, it's really, uh, it's really a great career. Um, so yeah, so I really appreciate you, um, kind of giving some advice uh, to the younger professionals as well. Um, so you know, we talk we talk about your experience and your background and things like that. And so now you're at White Box. You said you've been there for about two and a half years, and you kind of got there in the beginning. Mm-hmm. But why, why don't you give us a little bit about uh, uh, what White Box is and and what it is that you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, White Box is a a pretty unique. Um, pretty pretty neat company uh, the problems that we're trying to solve are are really aligned with what brands are trying to solve today i think to talk about that to just take a quick step back i mean if you're thinking about e-commerce um e-commerce has really shattered the way that even before kind of covid and you know kind of a weird last 12 months that we've had um and, and the boost there it really fractured the way that that people bought things online uh, or bought things in general, but more, more, even more so in many ways, it changed the way brands sell things. I mean, think about the difference between going to buy ketchup. Um, back before e-commerce, you'd walk into um, a Walmart or a Target, and you've got a shelf, right, with a limited number of options because yeah. it's curated by buyers at these stores. Um, and you only have a few options to choose from. And just that's just not the truth, right? With, with e-commerce. Uh, and so you've got brands, challenger brands, new brands, and you've also got, uh, you know, kind of these legacy older brands that both now have to challenge with the, have the, the same challenge of how do I offer this to the new type of consumer on e-commerce? And, um, so white box really is, is focused on, uh, these a very practical problem that brands of, of any size have to deal with. And that is that you have to both move stuff, uh, and you have to sell stuff. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the two sides of the business. And uh, White Box is uniquely set up where half of our leadership team and, and founders come from the ad tech background, mm. advertising, marketplace management. Uh, and the other half really come from Amazon and, and an operational background. Yeah. So we're, we're set up to do uh, both of these things in the same house. So for example, on the sell stuff side, um, we do ads, content, and listings. Um, so we kind of do full marketplace management. We're Amazon experts. We know how to do... Uh, our fulfillment centers, we send stuff into, uh, you know, uh, in Amazon, I actually helped design some of those receiving processes and requirements. So now I'm kicking myself a little bit because <laughs> I have to adhere to them, uh, which is very annoying. Oh, oh, uh, but uh, I know them really well. So yeah. we're, you know, really best in class at, of uh, doing fulfillment. Uh, I'm sorry, for, for kind of that the marketplace management. And then mm-hmm. on the other side, kind of the move stuff side, uh, we do fulfillment for uh, B2B, direct to consumer, um, drop ship for retailers. Uh, and kind of our mission statement on the move stuff side is to be, you know, a high volume, low defect fulfillment network connected to every marketplace. And that's kind of our, our vision and, and mission for the move stuff side. Um, but I think all that being said, White Box really is at our core, we're a, we're a tech company. We're a tech company who, okay. who does things um, versus just a fulfillment company. And, and kind of the, where we've planted our flag is, when you have move stuff and you have sell stuff in the same ecosystem, the data from both of those um, transactions actually help inform the other side. 
Uh, so your advertising is better if you know where you are shipping and your costs associated. And your uh, moose side is better uh, if connected to all the marketplaces and you know where to put all your products, which reduces shipping costs, improves your margin, and allows you to spend more on marketing. So Webbox is really a tech company focused on uh, gathering data transactions through having a, a world-class top-notch move stuff side okay. and separately a, uh, a top-notch uh, marketplace management and advertising uh, 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 business as well. Gotcha. So, so if I'm a customer of Whitebox, kind of where where do I start? I have I have like a product line, and you guys kind of manage that, or how how does that go? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, most brands today have uh, have a couple different online e-commerce presences, mm-hmm. right? Um, they have their own branded store generally, uh, and they have Amazon. Those are kind of the the two main platforms that right. almost every brand who is who's out there. Uh, I'm going to use the term born. D to C, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, somebody who started on e-commerce. So those are kind of like the, the two most people are going to have. Uh, so uh, we we can help with both of those, right? We help you manage Amazon, do all of the everything, all of the difficulties, the annoying parts of dealing with Amazon. They're not very nice to sellers in some scenarios. They make it challenging. <laughs> yeah. We help smooth that over. And we've got a huge team of experts that help navigate that. On the you know, you have a Shopify store, for example, we do fulfillment for that. We've got three warehouses, um, you know, Baltimore, Memphis, and Las Vegas, um, where we do fulfillment nationwide, you know, uh, coverage over the U.S. for fast uh, shipping um, for, you know, a Shopify store. There are also some brands that have, a, you know, a, a retail presence, and we can do B2B transactions for that and or, you know, drop ship for Walmart or Costco or Home Depot or whatever that would be. We also do fulfillment from those transactions. So generally, we work with um, brands that are, I kind of describe it as uh, one good fit for us is somebody who's like outgrown their britches, right? Like they've, okay. they've uh, either started with a small 3PL, they're shipping out of their garage, mm-hmm. and they, you know, they're seeing really rapid growth and they need somebody to help out. We fit really well with somebody like that or mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a larger legacy brand who's trying to understand how to navigate Amazon and some of those direct consumer pieces. So we, we kind of get, get it from both directions um, in the way that we work with, uh, you know, our partners today. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, I'm curious, have you, you mentioned, you know, the, the person that's outgrowing their garage, right? So, so with the pandemic and kind of the, the big spike in e-commerce, have you, have you seen a lot more customers coming to you because they're getting to that point? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think uh, 2020 is, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be something really interesting to kind of look back to 2020, I guess now into 2021 um, in the way that buying behavior changed for consumers, as well as, you know, how brands have navigated this. I think you kind of saw two trends um, and I think they're important trends in 2021, a uh, huge lift in e-commerce Two, a lot of those brands that were kind of smaller or just outside their garage and working with smaller three PLs that don't have either a national presence or capacity to scale. Um, they're more kind of the mom and pop shop 3PLs. We got hit with a ton of these who said, hey, we just lifted 100% in sales in three months and wow. my 3PL can't do it. They're backlogged. You know, carriers are having problems as well. The combination is uh, just a terrible customer experience for all of my consumers and I need help, right? Mm-hmm. So we just got a huge influx of those type of opportunities and those problems need to be solved by, um, by folks across the US. So that is a huge lift. Um, disproportionate to the time that it took to get there yeah. in 2020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And it, it, just like you said, I mean, it'd be interesting to look back, but I think, you know, a lot of e-commerce just kind of spiked up in the past year. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people um, are very much in this scenario, like you mentioned, where they're, they're just outgrowing what they were doing before and they've just found like unprecedented growth that maybe – Maybe they never expected or didn't expect for for a long time, but it, it's it's just pushed forward. So, so it's been really interesting to see. Um, so, I'm curious. You know, we talked about your experience at Amazon um, and now at White Box, and you said you you said you got there somewhat in the beginning of White Box. And I'm curious what what skills did you learn at Amazon that you were able to bring over to White Box, and that's kind of helped white box to get to where it is and also probably helped it with this, this rapid growth in the past year as well. It sounds like, um, what, what skills kind of transferred over from there? 
We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It's a very long list, um, <laughs> uh, but I think some of the ones that stand out the most, I mean, Amazon has these very public um, leadership principles, mm -hmm. Uh, right. So I, I think if you kind of break them down into, you know, soft skills and some more, uh, you know, practical things that I was able to do with my hands, I think first, um, the leadership principles Amazon had, like they, they may seem a little cheesy on the outside, but, but they really helped kind of guide me through what it meant to be a young leader. And kind of as I was determining what's the leader I wanted to be, what does that look like? How do I interact with others? Uh, you know, I, I think that really helped me. Well, the biggest one for me is ownership. Mm. I think so, so much of everything, if you think as an owner um, and you are an owner, uh, that's such a critical part of, of doing anything. Uh, if it's transactional where I'm doing a thing to get a paycheck, uh, you know, I mean, like, it's just not interesting enough for me, right? So I wanted not only to do that for myself, but to build a culture as a COO, right? Like, you know, I set the tone yeah. for... Uh, what the rest of the company feels like. So white box, one of the decisions we made early on was, you know, everybody in the company gets equity in the company. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that that ownership is like, you're literally an owner in the company. You are yeah. tied to its, its success. Um, and I thought that that was a, a pretty uh, important thing I learned from Amazon was, you know, people who think like owners uh, do a lot more. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too little for them. They're going to sweep the floor or they're going to say, hey, you know, this is a dumb way to do this and we shouldn't do it anymore, uh, right? Like a person who's a true owner does both of those things at the same time um, and looks for opportunities to impact a lot more than the space they find themselves in. So I think that was like one kind of soft skill and, and kind of, I guess, more of just a mindset, the way that I attacked right. building my team at Whitebox that uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, I, I took that, that part away. I think the on the other side, I mean as far as fulfillment operations go, like Amazon just can't be touched, right? Like you, yeah, you've got some of these really the basic one. skills. And while I was there, I was in uh, quality control mm -hmm. and then, I, and I was in inbound processes and I helped literally write the book on how to, how to inbound at Amazon yeah. uh, well and how to run those processes. And then I got to go in outbound in some of the highest performing outbound process paths. So those are the three main buckets at Amazon. And I really got, I got a taste of all of as deep as possible. Like I went, you know, a mile deep all of the time um, and really got to master those processes. And uh, one of the cool things about white boxes, we do not, we build all of everything's homegrown. We're a tech company. We've got a team, a large team of developers and we've built all of our own WMS. We've built all of our wow. own connections to marketplaces. Mm. Uh, we don't rely on outside services um, because nobody's really doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we thought what we were doing was interesting. In 2018, I said, all right, I need a WMS. I went out to market and realize there's nobody really solving this problem in, in a way that you need to from a WMS perspective. So we've been, <laughs> we built our own, which is not easy. Oh, wow. um, and so I, I think the stuff that I learned uh, from beginning to end at Amazon allowed me to design software, which is, you know, as COO, um, the tech and product organizations also roll up to me. Roll up to me. So um, one of our founders, uh, Sean, who's the CTO, and I have spent an enormous amount of time um, you know, I designed a bunch and he and his team are, uh, you know, executing that. And it, it's been a really cool opportunity to solve really interesting, unique problems and be able to do it in a way that we've built our own tech along the way. I, I never, ever, ever would have been able to do that if I didn't attack, you know, the, the problems and have the opportunity to attack the problems I did at Amazon. So I think that, that skill set of finding the root cause of problems and um, breaking it down to its component parts is something that really we taught at Amazon and it doesn't come naturally. I don't think to a lot of people and uh, that skill set that I was able to learn, 
grow and hone at Amazon allowed me to be uh, significantly more impactful in, in my role from a white box from day one. Yeah. Wow. Well, wow, I can, I can imagine. And, and it, it's pretty awesome that you guys are, are building everything uh, from the ground up pretty much. I mean, it gives you like so much flexibility and, you know, I've worked at, you know, a couple of different companies and different warehouses, different warehouse management systems. And, you know, there's always some, some kind of limitation within the system. Um, so be, be able to build your own. I mean, that's like the ideal world, I would say, from, from my perspective, at least. It's definitely nice. The yeah. time that it's not ideal is when it breaks. You have no one to blame. <laughs> it's, li- <laughs> it's, uh, it's 100% you. So uh, when it, or, you know, the, one of the cool, frustrating, cool slash frustrating is mm-hmm. you design this thing, um, which you think is going to work and then it goes down the path and you're like, man, I, I totally messed that up. <laughs> I, you know, I was super, super wrong. Um, yeah. You can't blame anybody else for that, but you are correct. It's having the, the flexibility and that's what that's what the key for for modern commerce is today. Like selling things is not just e-commerce; just selling things in general. You need to have enormous flexibility, and there's just not anything out there on, on the market that can solve that problem today. So, very fortunate we have a very talented development team, which uh, is helping us solve some really cool problems. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I'm a, I'm a little jealous, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so would you say now, I mean, at White Box, I mean, it sounds like at, at Amazon, too, um, you know, even though your position and working within a large company is not necessarily what the, I guess, textbook definition of uh, being an entrepreneur is, but you're, you're more, in a sense, uh, an entrepreneur, it sounds like. So would you say that you, I mean, it sounds like you got to scratch that itch a little bit at Amazon, but I, it sounds like at White Box, you're really kind of getting to be that entrepreneur in a sense, but um, internally at, at the company, would you say so? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, just personally, it's been, <clears throat> it's been such a cool experience to move from, uh, you know, a, a huge environment where you've got uh, some people are solving some of those tasks you don't think about. Real estate, um, there's a safety organization that's already established. Uh, you know, you've got all these things that are, you know, finance and what do you use to clock in, right? Like some of those things that you don't, I don't have to worry about as a, a warehouse leader in a in a more established environment, or even when Amazon was relatively early, we changed those things a bunch. Mm. Um, but somebody else was doing that, and so having to do, you know, where do we put this warehouse? What size is the warehouse? Um, you know, how much racking? What's the equipment we should use? How do we establish the safety culture? Mm. Uh, you do that, and then also on the other side, you get to do stuff like how do you raise money? How do you yeah. raise a Series A versus a Series B? Who do you have on your board? So being part of both of those has been enormously challenging and enormously satisfying. Um, and I'm, I'm just uh, very pleased that I took the leap. I, I miss Amazon very much <laughs> yeah. uh, all the time. <laughs> and I'm also very glad that I left, mm-hmm. uh, not because of Amazon, but more because of the opportunity that it's given me to, to stretch and to learn and to just do something dramatically uh, different. Um, so it's been, I, I'm really grateful for that opportunity to do, you know, both entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in, in my career so far. So I do, I, I agree hundred percent. I think it's, uh, I'm excited about, you know, where I, where I go next and where we go next as a, as a company. So uh, it, it's been really great. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I was curious about that. So, so no, I guess kind of going back to white box a little bit and, and what it is you guys do. I mean, it, you know, we, we talked briefly a little bit about the, the spike in e-commerce and the pandemic and, you know, obviously it's so, uh, it's so evident in our industry. Um, but it's also, you know, we talked about creating some new online businesses and also these online businesses that people have created at home that kind of just are growing up now. Um, but, yep. you know, as people get to this kind of inflection point, I guess, in their, their home-based business um, and they're needing to look to like a 3PL or a service like Whitebox, how, how do they go about working with one and how do they go about the, the selection process and making sure they get the right fit for their, their size and what they're trying to do? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I have the, a really cool, this is another advantage of not being in an Amazon. I, mm-hmm. I, I get to talk directly to our partners, um, you know, CEOs and operational directors and, uh, you know, marketing, com- you know, uh, marketing arms at, at companies. And uh, I, have, I have pretty similar advice every time for them. And that is, um, if you're just getting started up, 
try try to do it yourself out of your garage as long as you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, which may sound counterintuitive for somebody who's trying to continue to grow <laughs> in the three PL <laughs> business, but um, you learn so much uh, getting direct feedback from your customers. Mm. Number one, and number two, uh, it is very expensive for you to go talk to a three PL if you don't have any volume. There, there's a minimum cost required to service any account, right. right? So the cost always becomes really, really high or you're going to go with somebody that is very it's a point solution that's lower cost that is not going to be able to scale with you so you just have to be really careful so Mm -hmm. keeping it in-house as long as you can is actually a great way to get consumer feedback and also keep your costs low when you need to keep the cash in your pocket Uh, as you continue to scale as you continue to grow uh, when you are ready to say yeah you know i can't do this anymore i'm doing way too much or it's costing me too much or my shipping rates are actually my biggest problem now that's where you start to think about, um, you know, people that are, that can do this for you. And I, mm-hmm. I think when, when you're doing that, uh, I really do believe that the future of, of e-commerce is not in point solutions. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really important for you to understand people that can do more than just one, either business to business or direct to consumer. Uh, I think that that's a super critical part of what future, uh, 3PLs need to look at as, mm-hmm. as people are coming into the industry. I think that the barrier to entry for 3PLs is going to get higher and harder, not easier. Um, And I think it's because they're going to keep adding in services. Um, But I think uh, really, you know, don't two things, look for the nickels and dimes, Mm. Um, you know, stuff like receiving and stuff like storage and long-term storage fees and transaction fees and PO fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those can add up. There's a lot of opportunities out there where they consolidate shipping services. Um, You know, a few of us are, trying to simplify it for brands and, and really make, you know, more, fewer fees. We don't like the old traditional 3PL, you know, just pay you for every time I look at your inventory mm. um, kind of thing. Uh, look for people who make money at the same time that you make money. Uh, so not a lot of upfront fees, but instead on the back end kind of load up fees. So they're encouraged to partner with you. I think that's a really important one. I think from the second one, um, a lot of people focus on if an order comes in today, it ships today. Uh, and that's not always actually the most important thing. The most important thing is delivery dates, because if you order something from me from New Jersey and I'm in Baltimore, you kind of don't care if I ship it today and it takes seven days still to get there. Um, so really focus on delivery dates and how, uh, those shipping options and the time from order importing to shipping those orders, how it impacts customer experience. Cause I think, um, the intersection of that is really important. It's becoming more and more challenging as you have more consolidation services like SurePost, SmartPost, DHL um, that are using USPS. Uh, you kind of saw that come to a head in, in peak of 2020 when carriers got really backed up. You saw UPS and FedEx and fees and a lot of volume pushed to USPS. So um, it matters a lot. Uh, and that may mean that it's not the cheapest solution every time. You got to look for somebody who really understands your customer because your customer is the key to growing your business. It's just 100% is even more important um, because you get that that direct relationship with a customer in e-commerce that you don't get selling to a Walmart. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I, I find it interesting that you uh, you give the advice of, of staying in the garage as, as long mm-hmm. as you can. Um, but it, I mean, it's it's honest uh, and direct uh, feedback, I guess, like you had said earlier. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you learned, yes. yeah. <laughs> you practice what you preach, right? Huh? Uh, so really interesting stuff um, with you and, you know, really interesting to hear about your journey and also what you guys are doing at White Boxes. It sounds uh, so it very interesting. And it, uh, you guys are relatively young. So I, I'm curious what what's the what's the future of white box look like what are, what are the plans for the next next couple of years yeah um i mean for, for us you know like i said before we we really have planted our flag between uh, that move stuff and sell stuff with mm-hmm. you know data surrounding all of that um the more data we can give to a brand collect for a brand and help them make better decisions that drive their business growth we benefit with them we grow with them and that's really what we want to be able to, to do so we're investing a lot in our technology on both sides and a lot in the surrounding infrastructure. So we've hired a couple data scientists um, that are specifically focused on how do we collect, store, and mm-hmm. provide that data back to brands to make better decisions. Um, so like that's definitely a huge investment from kind of a, a corporate level. If we kind of focus on the warehouse side, uh, we've really just started doing automation and robotics in our own facilities. So okay. 
Uh, we actually just uh, a couple of weeks ago here in, in January of this year, uh, have our first piece of, piece of uh, actual robotic automation in our facilities to help mm-hmm. with uh, sortation. So one of the things is, you know, we don't just ship UPS nowadays. Like we use uh, nine different carriers to dynamically choose order, the optimal order. Uh, I'm sorry, the optimal carrier for each order. So mm-hmm. that's a lot of sortation. So we've got our first piece of uh, robotic automation in our buildings uh, this year. So it's really around growing that that scalability and, you know, can you do this uh, 15,000 times a day and then 150,000 times a day and then a million times a day. Uh, you know, it's that scale and that growth. So we'll be able to could still give a, a homogenous experience for our, our partners and their customers. So uh, really it's, it's focused on, uh, you know, the last few years have been originally it was, does anybody want this? I'll give it away for free, right? Like, <laughs> does anybody want this thing? And it, it was a definitive yes. And yeah. uh, so I think th- those are some big ones. Uh, and then the last thing is, um, real estate right so uh amazon as they continue to move toward next day shipping same day shipping Mm -hmm. um your proximity to your customers becomes extraordinarily critical to be to stay competitive so i think for us it's you know where's the next warehouse location that's a strategic surgical um location that gets more population within that one day kind of bubble uh from from carrier perspective so i think those are kind of what the forefront of you know the roadmap for 2021 and and beyond. Mm. Very interesting. And, uh, definitely looking forward to seeing how white box grows and, uh, seeing how you grow as well. Your interesting journey and, uh, you're still young, so it's just getting started. Right. Um, so that's the hope. Yeah. <laughs> that's the hope. <laughs> so really, really interesting stuff with you, Robin. I appreciate, you know, not only sharing us, uh, sharing with us information about white box, but also, you know, just sharing some of your advice from your experiences as well. Um, I think it's really valuable stuff. So, so I really appreciate that. Um, how can people find out more information about white box? Uh, yeah, you can, uh, <clears throat> I, we're, we have a pretty decent presence on, uh, LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, if you look it up also whitebox.com has a ton of information and also multiple ways to get a hold of us. Um, jobs.whitebox.com. Um, we're always hiring. We have tons of positions open right now, ranging from operational warehouse positions to, operational support, account management, um, sales and marketing, uh, tons of positions there. So um, we've, you know, that's a great way to kind of start up a conversation with uh, with the White Box team and see how we can assist. All right, great. And we'll put links to all of that on the newwarehouse.com as well. So Rob, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing some of your insights with us. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Latte. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for the New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.